what I chose today was to talk about a place that is both real and imagined, the tomb of the first emperor of China. So located northeast of present-day Xi'an city, it was the locus of Herculean engineering efforts and unspeakable worker suffering during its construction, a holy and restricted place during its brief use as a working necropolis and shrine, a vilified and haunted ruin for centuries since its destruction, and now a destination for bustling international tourism and a symbol of national unity and power. Let's go back to Ying Zheng. The person buried in the tomb is this man, Ying Zheng, the first emperor, whose brutal unification of China culminated in 221 BC. Known for his sweeping reforms as well as his brutal policies, he is the most controversial figure in all of pre-modern Chinese history. Though he desperately sought over land and seas for an elixir that would grant him immortality and physical form on this earth, he also spent decades preparing a tomb to hold his mortal remains and nurture and guide his soul should that quest fail. And as excavations have revealed in the last 40 years, his tomb was unlike any other, befitting his unique status and accomplishments. That tomb lies 30 meters below the current ground level, further crushed under the weight of a man-made mountain, as you see here, still over 50 meters high despite millennia of erosion. In recent decades, archaeologists have made extensive explorations around the main tomb mound, and the main tomb mound is right here in the plan diagram here. They've revealed hundreds of satellite burials and sacrificial pits, including those holding bronze carriages, strongmen and entertainers, legal officials, bronze cranes and ducks, and of course, the magnificent terracotta warriors about two kilometers away. Though the depths of the tomb have been probed with physical and remote sensing devices, the sepulcher of the emperor has never been breached by archaeologists. Furthermore, despite historical anecdotes which suggest the tomb had been looted repeatedly in antiquity, there is actually no evidence at the surface of any looter's tunnel large enough to have reached the very heart of the tomb. So though the tomb of the first emperor might remain at least partially intact, the shocking reality is that we may never see the inside of this tomb in our lifetimes. Archaeologists in China have given various reasons over the years for not excavating this tomb, including the prohibitive cost, the difficulty of preserving delicate materials from further decay, and the permanent destruction to the site that excavation would cause. It may also be politically impossible to ever excavate this tomb, for exhuming the coffin of the man who is now considered one of the founding fathers of China would be tantamount to sacrilege. Since the tomb will not be excavated in our lifetime, if ever, we are left to do what historians, poets, and artists have done for centuries, and that is imagine what lies in the tomb of the first emperor of China. The unknown and unexplored nature of the burial allows the imaginer to project his own fears, his hopes, and expectations on the tomb, revealing far more about the observer than the place which is observed or imagined. So from its inception, the tomb had to be imagined and reimagined even by its own builders. The tomb project began shortly after 246 BC when Ying Zheng came to the throne as the king of Qin. And at that time, it was probably imagined as a typical Qin royal tomb with a deep pit, an underground replica of a palace, and numerous sacrificial pits and precious objects. But when the king united the world by force and became emperor and continued to live on into his late 40s, the builders had to imagine a greater design and purpose for the tomb. By the time of his death in 210, the designers had realized their expanded vision of a microcosm of the empire in a vast and complex necropolis. In their designs, they had to imagine a magic world in which half-sized chariots, real horses with clay grooms, stone armor, and clay soldiers holding real weapons were all credible and efficacious. The first written account of the tomb was brushed by Sima Qian, around 100 BC. Sima Qian was the director of the grand scribes of the Han Dynasty, basically a astrologer and supervisor of scribal education during the Chinese dynasty that succeeded the Qin. 
In his book, The Shurqi, or Grand Scribe's Records, he includes a chapter which is our only biographical account of the first emperor from anywhere near his lifetime. In fact, until the fruits of modern archaeology and the recent discovery of documents dating from the Qin period, Sima Qian's book was almost the only source of information about the Qin. His biography of the first emperor has colored all subsequent accounts, and his vision of the first emperor's tomb became the foundation for all later imaginings of this tomb. It even determines the research agenda of archaeological excavations. After the first emperor died in 210, his son and successor took upon himself the duty of burying his father and completing the tomb. So what follows here, and I'll go through this, is the original account of the tomb by Sima Qian. So in the ninth month, the first emperor was interred at Mount Li. When he first came to the throne, he began digging and shaping Mount Li. Later, when he unified the empire, he had over 700,000 men from all over the empire transported to the spot. They dug down to the third layer of underground springs and poured in bronze to make an outer coffin. Replicas of palaces, scenic towers, and the hundred officials, as well as rare utensils and wonderful objects were brought to fill up the tomb. Craftsmen were ordered to set up crossbows and arrows rigged so they would immediately shoot down anyone attempting to break in. Mercury was used to fashion imitations of the hundred rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and the seas constructed in such a way that they seemed to flow. Above were representations of the heavenly bodies, and below the features of the earth. Dugong oil, or some people think whale oil, was used for lamps, which were calculated to burn for a long time without going out. The second emperor said, of the women in the harem of the former ruler, it would be unfitting to have those who bore no sons sent elsewhere. All were accordingly ordered to accompany the dead man, which resulted in the death of many women. After the interment had been completed, someone pointed out that the artisans and craftsmen who built the tomb knew what was buried there, and if they should leak word of the treasures, it would be a serious affair. Therefore, after the articles had been placed in the tomb, the inner gate was closed off, the outer gate lowered, so that all the artisans and craftsmen were shut in the tomb and unable to get out. And then finally it says, trees and bushes were planted to give the appearance of a mountain. So let's examine a few aspects of this account, for these are the seeds that will grow in the minds of later imaginers of the tomb. First, let us consider the famous rivers and seas of Mercury. This is one of the most fantastic and unbelievable aspects of the first emperor's tomb. Mercury is a special metal in the mind of Chinese alchemists because mercury can sublimate directly to a gas and is liquid at room temperature. It's thought to have spiritual properties and help a person sublimate their body and become an immortal spirit. It was also thought to prevent the decay of the corpse itself, allowing the corporeal soul to continue to have a place to reside. But could there be hundreds or thousands of gallons of liquid mercury inside the tomb, installed so they would flow naturally like rivers and seas? Many modern critics have concluded that this must be a complete fantasy on Sima Chen's part. But archaeological surveys in the last three decades have twice probed the tomb mound and discovered that, indeed, the levels of mercury in the soil are far higher than actual background levels of mercury. Some scholars have gone even further and claimed that if you draw a picture of this distribution, it looks like a map of China with concentrations where the great rivers flow. But I believe this is a very fanciful reconstruction, and I'll show you that slide in a little bit, based on wishful thinking that Sima Chen's account of the great rivers and seas of mercury is actually, is entirely accurate. So we can accept that there was large quantity of mercury in the tomb, but whatever form that mercury had originally been installed in has since broken up and diffused throughout the soil. Furthermore, if we look at histor later historical anecdotes, we can probably gain a more realistic impression of what form this mercury took. In accounts of the tombs of kings who reigned in the centuries prior to the first emperor, we also see mention of pools of mercury installed in tombs. So based on these accounts, it appears that the first emperor's rivers and seas of mercury were not a complete fantasy on Sima Chen's part, but may have been an elaboration on the tradition of earlier kings. In any modern account of the first emperor's tomb, the authors always have to mention those automatic crossbows. 
Recall that they were set up to instantly fire at anyone who tried to break into the tomb. Such a technology was entirely within the reach of Chinese craftsmen of the day, for sophisticated crossbows and gear mechanisms certainly existed during the Qin and Han periods. Whether the corridors of the tomb were actually outfitted with automatic crossbows, we shall probably never know, but the very idea of an automatic crossbow booby trap has stimulated the imagination of movie directors and video game designers who have staged the first emperor's tomb, for it's such a dramatic concept. Then we come to the, one of the more morbid aspects of the account. Sima Chen mentions that many of the women of the harem of the first emperor were to accompany him in death. This sort of sacrifice was not unprecedented in Qin tombs, for the tombs of his royal ancestors contained many human sacrifices. But by his day, the practice had diminished among the nobility. He also mentions the craftsmen who created the tomb were tricked and locked in the tomb for eternity. And this is very dramatically illustrated if you watch modern documentaries with um, recreations in them. But one has to ask, if the artisans and designers knew what was in the tomb were all buried alive, then how did Sima Chen know what was in the tomb? <laughs> Perhaps he did not have definite knowledge of anything in the first emperor's tomb. Perhaps he made up the entire account out of whole cloth. For example, he mentions nothing about the terracotta warriors buried to the east of the tomb. Very little of the above ground tomb complex fashioned mostly of wood and earth would have survived to his day during nearly a century after the first emperor had died. So if I had to speculate, I would say that Sima Chen's account was mostly based on legend, probably supplemented with some information drawn from official documents, such as those that might record the number of workers engaged in construction. But the rest of it likely sprang from his own imagination, fueled by popular legends, and informed by his familiarity with Han imperial tombs from his own day. I would also argue that in the absence of reliable documentary information or firsthand knowledge of the tomb, Sima Chen allowed his own interpretation of the first and second emperors as historical characters to shape his imagination of the tomb. The underground realm that he imagines for the first emperor is a suitably magnificent final resting place for the man portrayed in his biography, who considered himself to be the greatest world, ruler the world had ever seen. And the microcosm of the empire represented in that account is entirely in line with the emperor's character as portrayed by Sima Qian. Furthermore, his assessment of the second emperor as a cruel tyrant is projected through the story of the interred concubines and artisans. So Sima Qian's account delves deeply into the realm of exaggeration with the rivers and seas of mercury and borders on the fantastic with the bronze outer coffin and the automatic crossbows. But it never steps into the realm of the supernatural Despite its biases and unreliability, Sima Chen's account still forms the fountainhead. This is the source that shall inspire all other authors and designers in their imaginings of the first emperor's tomb. So Sima Chen's account clearly inspired the wildly imaginative retelling of Wang Jia, written nearly five centuries later. Wang Jia was a reclusive late fourth century Taoist who lived for a time in a cave that he carved out of a hillside. His chief surviving work is a collection of stories called the Shi Yi Ji, the record of gleaned remnants, about the early dynasties of China filled with wondrous and strange events. He claims that the stories he collected were left out of the standard histories like the Grand Scribe's records, and he merely set them down so the whole story would be preserved. His stories set during the Qin Dynasty are full of supernatural wonders, like strange non-human visitors to the first emperor's court who arrived in a submarine shaped like a conch shell. So his account of the first emperor's tomb clearly relies on Sima Chen's description as a starting point and then elaborates on it to enhance the wonder of the site. The latter portion of the account reads as follows, and I won't read out the entire thing, but I highlighted certain passages. He talks about the buried alive, the craftsman who made the tomb, constructed rivers and oceans and models of the terrains and hills and mountains. So all of this is very much in line with what Sima Chen said before. So he rests on the same ground or underground as Sima Chen. We have the rivers and oceans, terrains of the earth, constellations of the sky, the craftsman. But then to instill wonder in his audience, accustomed to tales of the supernatural, his underground ocean is now filled with boats and inhabited by a giant jade whale, as well as glass turtles and fish. And the stars in the ceiling are now made of crystals 
that emit light, and most incredible, the artisans who were buried alive were still alive. <laughs> More than three years later, when the tomb was looted, the craftsmen even managed to create further works of art while they were trapped in the tomb, <laughs> confirmed by a cross-check with Qin Dynasty records of what was supposed to be buried in this tomb. And it also said that they carved a stele of resentment uh, <laughs> of being buried in the tomb alive. So obviously, this account is an imaginative embellishment on Sima Qian's original, which, as I have argued, displays a healthy measure of imagination as well. Like other authors before him and since, Wang Jia was likely impressed by Sima Qian's description of the first emperor's quest for deathlessness and his longing to meet immortal beings. Given Wang Jia's reputation as a Taoist recluse and practitioner of macrobiotic techniques himself, and as a man with near supernatural powers of insight, it seems reasonable that he projected his worldview and expectations onto the first emperor's court, seeing it as a wondrous place, a Camelot, inhabited by wizards and visited by immortals, a world where the fantastic was commonplace. He then projected this world into the tomb of the first emperor, pushing the mere exaggerations of Sima Qin well into the realm of the supernatural. So the French novelist, sinologist, archaeologist, and visionary poet Victor Segalen, 1878-1919, was the first Westerner to photograph and extensively describe the tomb of the first emperor. After his sinological training under Edouard Chavannes in Paris, he obtained a two-year stationing as an interpreter with the Marines in China, which would mark the first of three trips he would take there during his brief but full life. It was during these years in China that Segalen conceived and wrote many of his literary works on China, which created a new genre of informed exoticism, a shocking hybrid of Western and Eastern aesthetics. Segalen first gazed upon the tomb mound of the first emperor of China during his second trip on February 16, 1914, after surveying a series of Han and later tombs in the Wei River Valley with their uninspiring hemispherical mounds. So these are some of his pictures in the countryside as he was in the Wei River Valley. Though he became the first Westerner to, quote, discover the location of the first emperor's tomb, this did not amount to much of a discovery because the locals always knew it was there and they actually took him to the site. <laughs> So along with capturing the tomb mound for only the second time with photography, a Japanese school teacher had done it about a decade earlier. This is his very famous and oft reproduced photograph of the tomb mound. You see it in the back, and there are no trees on it back then because those were planted in the 70s to prevent erosion, excuse me, the 50s to prevent erosion. So when he first saw the site in February 16th, he wrote this in his journal, suddenly, Toward the end of a pretty road of yellow earth, it, his man-made mountain, unmasked in its splendid layout. It is not a blunt tomb, a spoiled egg, a constructed clod of earth, a globular loaf of bread. But for the first time in China, a noble monument of yellow earth, gray-yellow in this purple twilight of Mount Li, and whose foundation, the symmetrical and overlaying curves, the power of the lines, the elegance of its intentional design of the double modulation cannot evoke others. One can only name the name of Cheops, builder of the greater Great Pyramid. Immediately following this page in his notes, Segalen wrote out Sima Chen's entire account of the first emperor's tomb from the Grand Scribe's records. Seeing the site in person and then rereading Sima Chen captured Segalen's imagination. He would return to this wondrous place repeatedly in his later published works, but never again in person. And eventually, through the genre of poetry, he would unleash the full power of his imagination and penetrate the tomb with his mind. <clears throat> me. The results of the archaeological survey that he did back in 1914 were published in preliminary form in the Journal Asiatique during World War I. And so he published a plan and elevation of the tomb mound for the first time with roughly surveyed measurements along with notations of the remains of the foundation pillar gates which once guarded access to the walled precinct 
and he made some conjecture about the size of the underground crypt based on the reasoned presence of a long tomb ramp and the angle that it would have to travel. But in 1916, he also published Peinture, Paintings, an experimental book of poetry inspired by Chinese paintings written over the previous six years. Many of the poems describe images seen in Chinese landscapes or other genres of paintings, but Segalen's paintings are all imaginary and the representations are frequently mystical and reality bending in nature. One section of the book paints word images of what he calls dynastic paintings, evoked by famous sites or events in Chinese history. And the first poem in that section is called The Tomb of Qin and represents an imagining of the tomb of the first emperor, taking the reader beyond the visible site on, above ground. Following on his more scientific work, measuring the tomb and recording it, this is Segalen's poetic imagination in full flower. After describing once again the grandeur of the stepped pyramid of the emperor's tomb, he writes, this is not a natural sport of land, but the monument of 800,000 man days, erected to the glory of the only King of Qin, Emperor Wan. But no, you will see nothing if you remain thus. Spectators overwhelmed by appearances, let me guide you deep inside. You must penetrate this tomb. For that, shut your eyes, your visible eyes, and accept to see blindly each word that I say. The surface is breached. Here we are on the other side of the earth, but not in blackness. We are following the path of the soul into the heart of the monument. It is a long vaulted corridor lit only at the far end at 500 paces distance by yellow fires whose oblique reflections encrusted in the walls caught by the countless figurative scenes on the walls rebound at us. All is covered with storied bricks, touch them Feel how brick is akin to earth and for a tomb more intimate. Do you not agree for its decoration? So taking us through the surface of the earth in an excavation in his mind, Segalen imagines a long vaulted entrance corridor still lit by magic torches. The walls are encrusted with pictorial bricks similar to Han Dynasty pictorial stones such as those of the Wuliang Shrine, that you see in the background there, made famous by Segalen's teacher, Edward Chavan. Segalen goes on to describe how the pictorial bricks illustrate scenes from the life of the emperor, including his conquest of the other states, the assassination attempt of Jing Ke, and the infamous burning of the books. After this, he then continues into the heart of the tomb. And here we are before the sepulcher, having entered the vault shining with yellow lamps, leaving behind the obsessional corridor over full with images for this perfect hollow cube solid on its pavement of bronze cast in one slab. By magic, the mass of women is still there. Those 200 concubines buried alive with him and whom yellow night perpetuates without awakening, without agony. But high up, it is more astounding. The ceiling which supports the weight of three hills seems to be woven out of the thinnest drawings of the sky. Below you walk on depictions of the earth, river and seas. All around are the models of palaces of the destroyed kingdoms that he brought back amid his own. There are jewels, rare objects, worlds he imagined or which his desire conjured up. But already you listen no longer. You lean over the sarcophagus. You attempt to see inside through a crack between the top and sides. Yes, you can see inside. It's empty. Men will tell you five years after his death and the rites, the great tomb was ransacked by rebellious hordes. The corpse flayed, the jewels melted down and that we are not the first to penetrate up to here. Historians' tales. The tomb is empty, that is true, but the whole empire is still filled with him, administered by his law, united into one, whole by his strength. And as for him, he is neither here nor there. He did not stop to rest long in his sepulcher, that's it. He has disproved the poet. He has not known the sadness of whitened bones. Perhaps the potion was the right one, and he is not dead. Such is his grandeur that his name, Shi Huangdi, raises and rends the earth. Back away, let's leave this tomb in haste. But here he is, as he was, coming towards us, without decorations or attributes, spilling over into the space around him. This stocky, majestic man with a prominent nose, wide eyes, 
the chest swelling like the breast of a bird of prey under his caress, him and nothing else around. Both hands hard against his belly, he controls with difficulty more than a belly full of pride than the rest of mankind. There is a man who tames men or at his ease devours them. He stands erect, his legs akimbo. So Victor Segalen, despite his formal sinological training, was also a novelist and poet. <laughs> and he was an inheritor of a long European tradition of Orientalism. He still wanted to see ancient China as a great Oriental civilization, on par with that of Egypt, which had been resurrected so brilliantly by his countrymen a century earlier. Chinese palaces and funerary monuments were built of wood and rammed earth, not of limestone and marble. And they left no impressive ruins like the Temple of Karnak or the Great Pyramids. Segalen's imagination of the first emperor's tomb, as seen in his journal entries and his poetry in the book Peinture, was an attempt to place the Chinese mausoleum on the same level with those Egyptian monuments, so well known to Europeans through illustrations or tourist travel. He equates the slumping earthen mound of the first emperor's tomb with the Great Pyramid of Cheops and describes a gallery of bas-relief images leading into the crypt suitable for a tomb in the Egyptian Valley of the Kings. Though his imaginative account is clearly based on the writings of Sima Chen, his mystical poetry cannot stop there. In the end, he leads us back into the realm of the supernatural, much like the words of the Taoist wizard Wang Jia. The torches blaze in perpetuity, sacrifice concubines are revivified, and the first emperor stands before us. Standing at the beginning of the 20th century, Victor Segalen represents the two strands of modern imaginings of the tomb, the archeological vision seen in site reports, exhibitions, and documentaries, and the fantastic vision seen on the silver screen and in video games. So those are the ones I'll be going through in the second half of the talk. So archeologists like to consider themselves scientists, and they insist that their reconstructions of the past are based on facts and reason. Even if archeologists are ever able to excavate this tomb, they will still require imagination to reconstruct what was once there but is now lost forever. Archaeology is not unbiased, and what the archaeologist reconstructs is a reasoned hypothesis, not a fact. Archaeological reconstructions are part science and part artistic imagination, colored by everything the archaeologist has seen and what he expects to see. In this way, he or she is no different than the historian, the Taoist wizard, or the poet we have seen. Now, the more conservative archaeological reconstruction, typified by the syntheses written by Yuan Zhongyi based on excavations combined with ancient textual references, imagines the first emperor's tomb as a larger and more elaborate development of the style of Qin tomb seen in earlier generations, such as the Qin ducal tomb number one, the supposed tomb of Duke Jing of Qin. So housed in a modestly sized wooden structure at the bottom of a very deep pit, and I'll play that one again, accessed by long sloping ramps, the tomb itself would have been filled with bronzes, jades, and other ritual items. So this view is what informs this NHK documentary footage from 1994. The more imaginative vision, typified by the work of the archeologist Duan Qingbo, interprets the pattern of mercury levels we saw in the soil, and the slide was out of order, let me go to this one here. This is the pattern of distribution of mercury levels seen from above when they probe the tomb mound. And so in this pattern of dots, he sees the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> so he interprets these as actually resembling a map of the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and this is the soil resistivity readings, when you put electricity in the soil and you get it to bounce back, um, it can tell about underground features. And so this is the actual soil resistivity measurements, and he sees a particularly resistive section right here, and this is then reconstructed into this enormous chamber of the tomb, which he conjectures is 50 meters by 80 meters in size and 15 meters high as an air gap that still exists uncrushed under the tomb. He also interprets, uh, based on coring of the tomb mound, that there were these uh, rammed earth mounds inside the mound itself covered with wooden buildings with tile roofs, and that these wooden buildings were then subsequently buried under the rest of the tomb mound. 
So he's also reconstructed these tile-covered timber buildings embedded within the tomb mound itself. So that's the more imaginative of the archaeological reconstructions. Now we're going to get to movies. So the tomb of the first emperor of China has figured prominently in several Chinese and Western produced movies in the last 30 years, and I'll briefly introduce two of these. Representing the emperor's tomb for the cinema presents some special challenges. For movie audiences expect a visual spectacle, laid out on a carefully lit stage with elements of danger and suspense and occasional comic relief. While the booby trap devices mentioned by Sima Chen certainly provide the danger element, the dark cramped space of an actual Chinese tomb certainly would fail to deliver on the visual spectacle. So movie designers have expanded the tomb space into a vast underground chamber to set the stage for their action. They also feel compelled to incorporate the terracotta warriors in the tomb itself, since they are the most recognizable symbol of the site, even though it's highly unlikely that any such warriors would have been placed near the emperor in death, because he didn't even want armed soldiers near him on his own throne room. So first, let's look at the third installment of the Mummy franchise. <laughs> The Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Whereas the first two mummy movies starring Brendan Fraser were set in Egypt, The Mummy 3 is set in Civil War torn China in 1946 and 1947. The mummy of the title refers to the cursed remains of a Chinese ruler referred to as Emperor Han, but who obviously represents the first emperor of Qin, played in the movie by Jet Li. <laughs> Seeking the elixir of immortality, he is cursed by a witch who he betrayed who transforms him and his entire army into fired clay. They are later buried in a giant tomb. But there is a talisman that can revive him and make him immortal called the Eye of Shangri-La. A Chinese warlord named General Yang wants to use this device to revive the emperor and his army and serve him as he reunites a fractured China and after that, the entire world. So for some reason, in the movie, they place the tomb in Ningxia province in China, which is quite distant from Xi'an. Probably this was done to take advantage of the pyramid-looking Shisha tombs uh, for the opening sequence. There's also this here, the colossal statue of the emperor half buried in the sand at the tomb site. This is quite impossible since Chinese emperors did not commission statues of themselves like Egyptian pharaohs did. The entrance to the tomb consists of a huge door with elaborate carvings half hidden in the sand like an Egyptian tomb. The door is then dynamited by Alex O'Connell, the son of Rick O'Connell, to enter the tomb. And the tomb consists of enormous galleries, only a few feet below modern ground level. Once inside, Alex and his colleague are confronted by a series of booby traps. Not only the obligatory automatic crossbows like you see here, but also flying saw blades, <laughs> caustic chemicals, and huge crushing hammers. After stepping on a very conveniently placed switch, light shafts open to the sky, which beautifully illuminate the upper crypt and row upon row of terracotta warriors, which are actually the petrified real army of the first emperor. After solving a compass puzzle to enter the lower crypt, O'Connell finds a bronze horse pulled by bronze horses and a driver, reminiscent of those found in the sacrificial pit to the west of the real tomb mound. The chariot carries the inscription, if he is awakened, all mortals should despair. <laughs> Near this, Alex finds the bodies of the emperor's sacrificed concubines. Selfish bastard, he remarks. <laughs> O'Connell takes all this back to Shanghai to put on exhibit. You can rent the movie yourself if you want to find out what happens after that. <laughs> Okay, probably the most fantastic and ridiculous imagining of the tomb of the film, imagining of the tomb on film was represented in the Jackie Chan movie, The Myth, from 2005. In the movie, whose convoluted, convoluted plot I will skip, the entire mausoleum complex of Mount Li near Xi'an was just a decoy tomb. The real tomb was 200 kilometers away and can only be accessed through a cave behind a waterfall. Within this cave is a man-made tunnel filled with the obligatory automatic crossbows. The Tomb Raiders thwart these emplacements by shielding themselves as they walk with a steel mesh curtain. The tunnel leads to an enormous underground natural cavern, similar to those seen in many video games, allowing for a majestic setting. But what makes this representation unique 
And I'll show you that in a clip and then explain what's going on. Okay. So what makes this representation unique is the entire burial complex floats in midair within the cavern in a state of zero gravity. It turns out that a meteor fell in 211 BC, an event which is recorded in the Shurji. But according to the movie, this meteor had special properties, able to suspend gravity of any object that its rays shone upon. The first emperor had the meteor broken up and its pieces embedded in the walls of the crypt, which were then made everything float weightlessly, tens of meters above the requisite topographical map of China with its rivers of mercury. And of course, this feature is exploited for some entertaining zero gravity love scenes and fighting sequences. <laughs> as well as a catastrophic ending where the whole thing comes crashing down. OK, now we're going to go to video games. So the computer video game has developed rapidly in recent years, now sitting on par with the cinema and the novel as important storytelling genre. Whereas the most wonderful aspect of cinema has always been its ability to transport the viewer to another place and time to vicariously experience a story as an outside observer, the video game genre takes this engagement one step further by immersing the gamer directly in the world of the story, experiencing the first person perspective with the twists and turns of the plot largely result of his or her decisions and actions. Now when contemplating how to represent a vision of the first emperor's tomb for a video game, designers have to accept certain compromises, some of which are imposed by the conventions of the genre itself and some of which are generated by audience expectations. Within the video game genre, a game can be geared toward exploration, education, puzzle solving, or combat, or a combination thereof. All four of these game modes necessitate a large, well-lit world in which to operate. So a realistic environment for the first Emperor's Tomb is just not going to work for the video game format, just as it was unworkable for the movies. In addition, video game players come to a game with a set of expectations. They want the vicarious thrill of being the first person to enter the tomb and overcome its many booby traps and obstacles. In recent decades, with the increasing power of computer hardware and the growing violence found in many games, players also expect the game to involve exciting combat with unsympathetic enemies like Nazis or gangsters, or hordes of demons or zombies, where the fighting involves a real risk of the character dying. Nearly a dozen video games in the last two decades feature the Tomb of the First Emperor as a setting, and I'd like to survey three of them here. Probably the first game to depict the First Emperor's Tomb was Ripley's Believe It or Not, The Riddle of Master Lu from 1995. The game is set in 1936 and features Robert Ripley, the quote, famed collector of the bazaar. Ripley has become fascinated by the First Emperor's Tomb and the legend that's sealed in the tomb is this thing, the Imperial Seal, an enormous glowing inscribed emerald. In fact, the seal is actually a great talisman, granting unlimited power to whoever wields it. Ripley is afraid that if the seal falls into the wrong hands, that person could become, quote, a dictator unifying China by force, like a Hitler or a Mussolini. <laughs> the key to finding the tomb and rescuing the seal is one of the first emperor's wizards, Master Lu, who was sent by the emperor around the world to discover the elixir of immortality. Master Lu, uh, Ripley learns that Master Lu was also the designer of the tomb, who fabricated the deadly traps to protect its secrets. Master Lu did not believe the world was ready or responsible enough to wield the power of the Emerald Seal. So he created a multilingual Rosetta Stone-like tablet kept in the Hall of Classics in Peiping to serve as a key to unlock the tomb. It was written in three different lost scripts that Master Lu encountered on his journeys around the world. Only when the world was united and at peace, he believed, could anyone really solve the riddle. Ripley travels the, the globe in the game, or you as the character, to uncover these lost languages used by Master Lu in his steely text. 
When he finally cracks the code, Ripley is then attacked by Chinese collaborators hired by the Japanese imperialists who are also in search of the powerful imperial seal. Once in Xi'an, Ripley finally enters the antechamber of the tomb quite easily through a root cellar of a local peasant. The antechambers of the tomb feature a series of enormous rooms lit by blazing oil-filled bronze vessels and guarded by brightly colored terracotta warriors. The roof beams and walls are painted in an anachronistic Qing Dynasty palace style like you might see in the Summer Palace in Beijing. After using Master Lu's inscription to solve a puzzle involving the terracotta warriors, the player has to devise a way to get past the famous crossbows. And here you see he's hiding behind a chariot as he wheels past the wall of crossbows. And the dead guy there was the Chinese collaborator with the Japanese who did not have a shield to protect him from the crossbows. So finally, one enters the main tomb chamber. And uh, let me see, I'll give you a pan of this here. It occupies an impossibly large space, a vaulted dome the size of a football stadium. All around the perimeter are colossal painted terracotta warriors. Covering the floor is an exaggerated representation of Sima Chen's vision, the diorama of China in miniature with mountain peaks and rivers and the sea of mercury. You see there's the mercury there. At the far end, after a deep lake of mercury, sits an enormous palace building which houses the emperor's coffin. The next video game to be staged within the first emperor's tomb was called Qin, Tomb of the Middle Kingdom, also from 1995 or 94. I think it's 95, actually. Unlike the riddle of Master Lu, which is set in the 30s, Qin is set in the future, in 2010, not the future anymore. <laughs> But in 2010, contemporary China is split by rival military factions, reminiscent of the Warring States period of ancient times. Hal Davis, the CEO of Mega Media Corporation, has worked out a deal with some of these factions allowing him to excavate the first emperor's tomb. Scientific discovery is the last thing on his mind, however, as this aging billionaire is actually hoping to find the elixir of immortality within the tomb. As you, the player, are the archeologist sent by Mega Media to work on the dig. One night, a huge earthquake opens up a rift in the tomb and you literally fall in. So just as in the Riddle of Master Lu, entry into the tomb is incredibly easy. The printed game materials state that the goal of the designer was to, quote, reconstruct imaginatively what is in the tomb, what it might contain based on contemporary accounts of its construction and archeological evidence gathered from other sites. Their realized vision, however, is sheer fantasy, drawing almost none of its design from Sima Chen or from modern archeology. span when the player passes through the antechamber here, which is filled with unpainted terracotta warriors, he or she arrives at a circular entrance here to a vast man-made cavern that houses the tomb itself. And here's this great underground cavern. A voice then speaks out in Chinese that belongs to a scholar named Lu, probably the same master Lu featured in the previous game. He then says, that he was the designer of the tomb, and his spirit then narrates that the first emperor employed 700,000 men for 40 years to dig to this point, but when they reached a depth where chisels could no longer penetrate and fire could not burn, which is actually a textual reference to an ancient text, he ordered them to create a horizontal space two miles in area, and that's this huge underground world. It is in this vast underground world where the remainder of the game plays out, as well as in two fantasy realms that appear to be nowhere on Earth. The cavern is filled with replica palaces, foundry and clay workshops, and numerous rooms filled with puzzles you have to solve. Many contain artifacts based faithfully on known archaeological artifacts, but anachronistically most are Han Dynasty artifacts like the Zhang Hung earthquake detector you see there. The goal of all these puzzles is to learn how to concoct the elixir of immortality. Master Lu apparently did succeed in finding it, but he deceived the emperor and did not share it with him probably for fear of what he might do with an everlasting life. An interesting feature in this game, though, is the possibility of divergent endgames, depending on the choice of the user. At the end of the game, once you have concocted the elixir of immortality from these ingredients you found within the tomb, you have a choice. You can pour the elixir, which is represented by the words Changsheng, right, on the coffin of the first emperor here, or you can give it to Hal Davis, the media mogul, uh, who's sort of Rupert Murdoch, uh, or confer it upon the Earth itself. If you give it to Mother Earth, you engender a great revival of the planet, 
Within 10 years, meaning 2020, long-term conflicts in the Korean Peninsula and the Middle East are all settled. <laughs> It gets better. China is united under a democratic government that guarantees basic civil liberties. <laughs> and global warming stops. And the Amazon regrows. If you give the elixir to Hal Davis, he becomes the richest and most powerful man in the world and begins to look 20 years younger. Conflicts in China and around the world worsen, and climate change devastates the whole planet. Finally, if you pour the elixir on the coffin of the first emperor, he is revived. Ying Zheng, the first emperor, reappears in society as a regular man with the same name. And he starts to work his way back into power slowly, first as mayor of Beijing, and finally reunifying the country in 2020. He then goes to the UN and addresses the General Assembly and warns all the countries of the world that if they can't get their houses in order, they can step down and he'll do it for them. This is the first suggestion in a game or movie that a revivified first emperor of China would likely take over the chaotic and fractious modern world a theme that resurfaces repeatedly in later movies and video games. So the last and final game I'd like to examine here is Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb from 2003. The story is set in 1935, just before the events in the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's a legend, they say, that the first emperor of China possessed a powerful talisman called the Heart of the Dragon, which was a flawless black pearl that gave one the power to, quote, control the will of men. When the emperor perished, it was buried somewhere in his tomb. Another magical artifact called the Mirror of Dreams is said to hold the key to entering the crypt, but it had been broken into pieces and scattered around the globe. Indiana Jones is approached by Marshal Kai Ti Chang, who claims to be an agent of the nationalist government of China. He wants to hire Dr. Jones to recover the Mirror of Dreams, enter the tomb, find the heart of the dragon before it falls into the wrong hands, meaning the Nazis. In reality, Marshal Kai is actually an ambitious crime syndicate boss, originally in league with the Nazis, who wants the talisman for himself so he can revive the first emperor and become master of China. So when Indiana Jones finally has recovered the pieces of the mirror, he and his assistant, Mei Ying, travel to Xi'an and enter the tomb rather easily. And I'll show you the video here. He doesn't want to draw attention to the site. It's incredible. Yeah, incredibly dangerous. No one's seen anything like this for 2,000 years. So they rappel down this enormous, into this domed antechamber built of stone and lined with tall red columns reminiscent of the Ming tombs in Beijing and guarded by serpent statues and colossal warriors, obviously inspired by the terracotta warriors. After overcoming countless booby traps, let me see if I have some examples of some of the booby traps here. Um, yes, in this one you have to um, go through these like lightning beams which come out of these dragon's mouths to the side. There's also um, crushing walls and all sorts of other booby traps. You have to outwit your Nazi rival. Um, you finally arrive at this. So this is quite fantastic, far surpasses any of those seen in earlier published games. The crypt lies in this enormous underground cavern again, uh, lit by hanging lanterns. To reach the emperor's tomb, which is located on a promontory in the far back, as you see in the left, Indiana must tra traverse a hazardous replica of the Great Wall of China, which is, of course, based on the stone Ming version of the wall. Each segment of the wall rises and lowers, and it's also guarded by terracotta warriors who come to life um, animated by a glowing blue spirit, and you have to fight them and kill them with a special weapon in his hand called the Bachung, right? So once he finally reaches the tomb of the emperor here, once he reaches where the emperor is, he finds his ash gray body still seated on the throne with the big heart of the dragon pearl jammed in his mouth. The emperor is surrounded by anachronistic items such as blue and white late imperial vases and carpets modeled on the throne rooms in the Forbidden City. And let me play this clip here because this is rather hilarious. Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good, all things considered. I don't think he'll be needing this.
So after the wisecracking comment, Indiana pulls the pearl out of the emperor's mouth, failing to notice that his eyes blinked and his brows furrowed at the irreverent comment. The emperor then rises up from his throne and declares that he has finally returned to life, and this time he'll rule the entire world. Suddenly his body is surrounded by the vengeful spirits of his former victims who then destroy him once and for all. So these video games, all produced by American game studios with some Chinese American consultants, share several themes. In all of the games, the quest of the main character is to reach the inner crypt. This allows the player to vicariously, quote, be the first person to enter the emperor's tomb in over 2,000 years, a phrase spoken by characters in several of these games. However, none of the characters has to laboriously dig through the mound to enter the tomb, for entry is effected through some very simple portal. The famous crossbow booby traps mentioned by Sima Chen also make an appearance, for dodging projectiles is a natural for the video game genre. Some, like Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, add those additional hazards like lightning bolts, shooting flames, floor spikes, bottomless pits, crushing walls. As one might expect, the terracotta warriors, the most recognizable emblem of Chin material culture, always make an appearance. Sometimes they're just standing silent guard, but in Indiana Jones, they become animated by supernatural forces and must be destroyed. But the most intriguing theme shared by all the games is the notion of this powerful talisman buried in the tomb which gave the first emperor his power or could signal his revival. Whether it's the imperial seal, the elixir of immortality, the heart of the dragon, these talismans effectively rob the first emperor of his humanity and his agency, for they suggest that only through supernatural means could he have accomplished his great deeds. The talismans also hold the ominous promise that the first emperor could return to wield power over the earth or that other power-hungry figures of our own time, Nazis, Chinese warlords, Japanese imperialists, or media tycoons, could recover the talisman and use it to enslave the world. In this way, the video game designers are projecting into these games their own deep-seated cultural fears of tyrannical oppression, of Nazis, of the Red Menace, and ultimately of the power of a rising modern China. The movies and video games that focus on the first emperor's tomb bring to visual completion what Victor Segalen already imagined in his poetic vision a century ago. One could enter the crypt of the first emperor and witness his awe-inspiring grandeur. However, breaching the tomb chamber also carried with it great danger. The powerful spirit of the emperor might be unleashed to once again rule China or even the world with his brutal regime. Though politicians and archaeologists may explain that they cannot excavate the first emperor's tomb for practical reasons, such as technological limitations, the deep subconscious fear of unleashing the emperor's powerful spirit is undeniably still lurking in the background. So in conclusion, I would say that as a place, the tomb of the first emperor of China exists more and has greater impact in the cultural imagination than it does in the physical world. Beyond the nearby vast fields of terracotta warriors, which are indeed awe-inspiring, the tomb itself is a disappointment, diminished, destroyed, and impossible to access. But these qualities also make it the perfect blank slate on which to project the visions and fears of centuries of historians, poets, video game and movie designers, and the modern archaeologists. Thanks.